coming up next on Hope Alive. And they have forgotten from whence they have come, and they have forgotten where they were when the Lord saved them, and because of that, they've put on a mask now of superiority. Or they may be highly educated, or they may be extremely blessed financially, or whatever it is, but they've put on a mask of superiority, and now they have erected themselves and sat on the seat of a judge, and they look at people with a superior attitude. Welcome to Hope Alive, an outreach of Greater Hope International Church, Lumberton, North Carolina. Now join us for today's message with Pastor Ron Barnes. Um, I'm going to give you the title of the sermon, but don't do what I say. Just hang tight and you'll see where I'm going here in a moment. The title of the sermon is called Take Off the Mask. Take Off the Mask. And I want to share it with you. And I'm reading today from a text that most of you have probably never, or a translation most of you have probably never heard of or never read. It's called the Weymouth New Testament. The Weymouth New Testament. Uh, it is a tremendous, tremendous translation. Now, it's, it was called the Modern Speech Translation. But the, it was written in, in the late 1800s and published for the first time in 1903. So it's not it's 19th century uh, language. It is one of the most uh, exact translations of the Word of God that you'll ever find based off of the, based off of the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the Greek. Uh, the gentleman's name was Robert Francis Weymouth who wrote it. He was a Bible scholar. He was a brilliant man. He was English, and he was a tremendous, tremendous scholar of the word of God. So I'm going to read it from the, from the Weymouth translation. I don't, I don't think we have it in the Weymouth translation, but you'll be reading it from either the NLT or the King James uh, on the screen. I'm going to read it for you, and I want you to hear what he says. Verses 38 through 30, uh, 47 of chapter 20 of the book of Luke. Just Most of this is written in red, so Jesus is doing most of the talking. He is not a God of the dead, but of living men. He is not the God of the dead, but living men. For to him all are living. All, I mean, are all living, I should say. I'm sorry. Then some of the scribes replied, Rabbi, you have spoken well. And from that time, however, no one ventured to challenge him with a single question. Whose son is the Christ? Whose son is the Christ? But he asked them, how is it that they say that the Christ is a son of David? Why did David himself say in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I have made the foes, uh, thy foes a footstool under thy feet. David himself therefore calls him Lord and how can he be his son? Beware of the scribes. Now Jesus says, beware of the scribes. Then in the hearing of all the people, he said unto the disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk about in long robes and love to be bowed in, in places of public resort and to occupy the best seats in the synagogues or at the dinner party, who swallow up the property of the widows and mask their, their wickedness by making long prayers, they will be punished far more severely than others." Now that particular verse in uh, verse 47 in the King James says, which devour houses and for to show, make long prayers, uh, the same shall receive greater damnation. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word and you may be seated. I know there are some that feel as though the only translation of the word of God is the King James translation. In fact, I've had a preacher tell me that the only uh, that it was the only one that Christ spoke of, and the truth is, Christ uh, never heard of the King James in this realm. Never heard of the King James translation. King James translation came along 1,600 years after the death of Jesus Christ. So it is not the only translation, and it is not the only translation that you should use in studying the Word. Now, you can just read it if you want to and just be a reader of the Word, but if you want to study the Word, you must study 
other translations of the Word of God. This particular writer, Robert Francis Wymouth, says take off the mask. Or he says they cloak themselves in the mask. We're now living in one of the most strange days that this world has ever seen. It's not the first time this has ever happened. There have been far greater pandemics than this particular pandemic. There has been the bubonic plague, which killed one third of the world's population. Did you hear what I said? The bubonic plague killed one third of the world's known population at that time. Then the 1918, of course, 1918, 1918, Spanish flu pandemic killed 50 million people around the world, killed over 5 million people here in the United States of America. We've had another pandemic in 1968 and 69 called the Hong Kong flu. I was a victim of the Hong Kong flu that developed into pneumonia and God gave me one of the greatest miracles of my life by saving my life during that particular pandemic, hospitalized four days that I do not even remember of my life because of that particular pandemic. My mother's here, she is a witness to that particular situation and I was near death, but God healed me and brought me out. And during that particular time, 1.5 million people, uh, uh, 35,000 people died in the United States and between two and a half million and three million people died worldwide. Now we're in the COVID uh, pandemic and people have taken this COVID pandemic and turned it into a political uh, farce and they've turned it into something that is ungodly to make their political points and to speak their political agenda and I'm talking to believers who are watching me now on YouTube and Facebook I'm probably talking to some of you sitting in the building it's ungodly it is ungodly it is ungodly and it is used to use and turn people against each other and divide the nation even farther than it's already divided. Preacher, I did not come to hear you be political. I'm not being political. I'm being a pastor. I'm being a pastor that is on the wall. I'm being a pastor that is a watchman who cares for your soul. Somebody just say, go ahead and preach, pastor. Well, thank you. I think I will. Uh, but uh, I want you to hear me today. The writer here, Robert Francis Weymouth, says in that particular verse, in verse 20, take off the mask. If you read verse, uh, chapter 20 of the book of Luke, you're going to find that it's a very powerful uh, passage of scripture that you know. Chronologically in the life of Jesus Christ, it takes place in the last few weeks of his life. In fact, it may have taken place in the last two to three weeks of his life. Because not far after this, so long after this, you'll begin to read where Judas now connives to betray Christ. He now connives to make a deal to take the life of Christ. Because like in the book of John, you will begin to find out that Jesus, in the last couple of weeks of his life, he begins to reveal who he really is. I've shared this with you in my Bible teachings and our teachings in this church, that the vast majority of the ministry of Jesus Christ, he would not reveal who he was. They would ask him, are you the Christ? are you the Christ? He would answer them by giving them the word of God. He would quote to them the word of God. And can I say this to any one of you that are believers today? Don't argue with anybody about who you are. Don't argue with anybody about what you believe. Share with them the word of God and live the life according to the word of God. Okay, I didn't get a bigger response out of that, but everybody needs to hear me one more time. Don't argue with people about what you believe. Share with them the word of God and then live according to the word of God and God will manifest himself in your life. Uh, you will find this in particular, particular passage, some of the greatest verses in the Bible, a couple of the greatest verses in the Bible that you hear preached about in Pentecost and preached about in the Baptist churches and Methodist churches. In verse 17, for example, it says, And he beheld them and said unto them, What is it then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. They're talking to him about who was the Messiah. He said that the, the Messiah will be the head. He will be the chief corner stone. He was talking about himself, but he was talking to a people who had no mind of revelation, who had not the spirit of God dwelling in them. If you have not the spirit of God dwelling in you, the spirit of God cannot reveal the word of God unto you. 
Let me say that one more time so it sinks in real good. If you do not have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, then God cannot reveal what is in the Word of God. The Bible says His heaven's secrets will be revealed unto us. The song said His heaven's secrets will be revealed unto us. The Bible said they would not be, be revealed to the unbeliever. They would be revealed to whom? They would be revealed to those that believe. If you want to say, well, how do I get revelation? Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal the word of God to you. He said he was the chief cornerstone. And he was the one that the builders rejected. If you read this chapter properly, you will find, if you have a red letter Bible, that both the vast majority of the words in this chapter are written in red so therefore it it does garner all of our attention i shouldn't say garner it should demand all of our attention if we want to understand what jesus was saying and praying we must read these words jesus begins to talk to them about who he really was and in this particular passage of scripture he talks they begin to question his authority they say about what authority are you speaking like this? By what authority are you doing these miracles? By what authority? In other words, they saw the manifestation of the power of God. They saw him delivering uh, devil, uh, casting out devils. They saw him healing the sick. They saw him doing mighty works. And their only question was, by what authority are you doing this? Instead of praising God with him and praising God for the miracle and praising God for the manifestation that their own eyes witnessed, religious people want to know by what authority are you doing this and how does that relate to us today miracles can take place signs and wonders can take place and here's what they say well what denomination are you well, what what who is your bishop who is the one that's over you they're not worried about the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the blessing which they should be rejoicing they're worried about who has given you credentials they want to know who you're licensed under have you ever heard that uh, who has given you who ordained you what license do you hold honey it doesn't matter what license you hold or if you have a license at all if you have the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost in your life the manifestation Manifestation and the power of God will flow on your life. I do not read anywhere in the word of God that any of the disciples were credentialed by anyone. They were anointed by the Holy One. I do not read anywhere in the word of God where the congregants or the people that assemble themselves together in fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not read where it says they must be credentialed or they must. And don't, and everybody, don't get mad at me. Hold your seat. Grab your seat right now. I don't find anywhere in the word, word of God where it said your name must be on the roll book of a church. You must be a member of the church. You must become under subjection to the pastor or the bishop of the church I don't find any of that uh, any of that in the word of God I don't care what church you are a member of I don't care what church your world book your name is on if your name is on the Lamb's book of life that is the only thing that I'm concerned about these words are powerful these words that Jesus Christ is speaking and now they question by what authority he begins, if you read it in Mark and Matthew, which carry the same narrative, read it in Mark and Matthew, he begins to say, like, why, what authority? He said, whatever the Father says is what I say. Whatever the Father told me to do, I do. I'm not, do, I'm not speaking my own words. I am not doing my own works. I'm only doing what the, I've seen the Father do. I'm only saying what I hear the Father say. Jesus Christ did not take any, he did not take any honor for what he was doing. He said, it's not me. He was talking about the fleshly man. It is not me. It is the God that is in me. I'm here to tell every one of you today we need to understand that we have a living God who dwells in us in the person of God, the Holy Spirit. But let me get to my subject today where it simply said, take off the mask. Robert Francis Wymouth uses the word mask. It is used in two other translations of the word of God, the word mask in this particular connotation. And what he says here in this verse is this. He looks at the religious people. See, the biggest enemy of God and the, uh, of Christ and the most hindering 
uh, enemy of Christ was not the sinner. I've said this to you a hundred times at Greater Hope. I look at the sinner not as vile and wretched. I look at the sinner as my harvest field. I look at the sinner as the purpose that we are here. We are to go out into the highways and the byways and the hedges and do what brother Jack? Compel them to come into greater hope, to come into the church of God, to come into the Baptist church or the Catholic church. No, to compel them to come in and become members of the kingdom of God. Compel them, in other words, give them a reason to believe. And in this day and in this hour, I've already told you, my generation has failed so. My generation has let the generation behind me down so. My generation has let my daughter down. My generation has let my grandchildren down. My generation has let Brother, ha uh, Brother Lee down and Sister Holly down. My generation has let Tay down. My generation has let Amanda down. I'm not talking about individuals. I'm talking about this generation. That My generation. We have shouted. We have spoken tongues. We have run the aisle. We've taught them how to speak in tongues. But we have not taught them how to live when the enemy attacks them. We have not taught them how to walk in prosperity and blessing. We have not taught them kingdom principles. We have let them down. And the reason we have let them down is very simply this. We've put on the mask. We've put on the mask. How many of you during this pandemic, and I can listen, some of you that were near me and even on the praise team can tell I struggle with the mask because I've struggled with asthma all of my life. I struggle wearing that mask. Yes, last Sunday I had to excuse myself and go out for a matter of moments because of the mask. I felt like I was going to have to today. I've literally had a panic attack in, in the food line with the mask on. The mask is not something that I want to do and I don't do it for myself. I do it like I said for my 89 year old mother. I do it for everybody else around me. I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for them. I struggle with the mask. But how many of you have had on the mask and been in food line or been in Walmart or been wherever you are and you see someone that they know you or they recognize you but you don't know who they are because they have on the the mask. Oh, I'm here to tell you most of the people in the church world today have on mask and they're trying to hide who they really are from everyone around them. Do any of you know anyone in the church who has put on a mask but you really know who they are? And I began to pray about this and the Lord spoke to me and said, here's what some of them do. They put on the mask of superiority in the church. If you were raised in the full gospel church, if you were raised in the Pentecostal church, you certainly know folk like this who feel like because their position in the church, and I'm not talking about as a pastor, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, praise team member, a choir member. I'm not talking about their position in the church, but because they're in the church and they've been saved and sanctified and filled with the sweet Holy Ghost, as they would say in their testimony services, and they have forgotten from whence they have come, and they have forgotten where they were when the Lord saved them, and because of that, they've put on a mask now of superiority, or they may be highly educated or they may be extremely blessed financially or whatever it is but they've put on a mask of superiority and now they have erected themselves and sat on the seat of a judge and they look at people with a superior attitude uh, brother Ron you need to give me some scripture brother Ron doesn't want to preach and never preaches to you without giving you scripture let me just give you some scriptures about those who put on the mask of superiority and I'm here to tell you Jesus dealt with it in his day he dealt with it and I'm here what he said in Luke chapter 18 verses 9 through 14 this is what he says he's talking about the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector see a tax collector in that day which we know Matthew was uh, they called him a publican uh, he was a tax collector he wanted your money 
And he collected the money not for the Jew, but it for the Jew and for Rome. He collected the taxes. And the, the taxation in that particular day, so you understand, the Jew of that day, he was not paying what we call tithe of 10%. His tithe being exacted upon him by the priest was approximately 23%. Not counting the taxes that were put upon them by Rome. So they were really under a bondage uh, financially because of taxation. And that's why they hated tax collectors. But now the religious man walks in the synagogue and Jesus is there. And this is what Jesus beholds. And then Jesus said this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness this is what he said. They had, con they had confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Have you ever met anyone who was self-righteous? They looked down on everyone. I'm just going to ask it like this. Has anybody ever looked down on you in self-righteousness? If they have, raise your hand. Has anybody ever scorned you? Uh, has anybody ever scorned you, ladies, for cutting your hair? Has anybody ever scorned you for putting on a ring? Has anybody ever scorned you for taking your family to a movie? Has anybody ever scorned you because you listened to some kind of music that they did not think appropriate? We have been scorned in greater hope because we don't have southern gospel music. We've been scorned in greater hope because our ladies don't have on maxi dresses I've been scorned in greater hope because I don't have a tie but I'm here to tell you as long as I can still feel a flow of the Holy Ghost of God in my life and I can experience the anointing that this praise team was under this morning I don't care what the world says verse 10 says two men went into the temple to pray the Sadducee goes to pray and the ungodly tax collector goes in to pray. One was, a, one was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. Mm. Cheaters sinners, adulterers. I am certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even to lift his eye to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow and saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Peter says it like this. Peter says, humble yourself therefore under the almighty hand of God and in due season he will exalt thee. Can I make a declaration to some of you and some of you that are watching here today? I want you to look at someone and declare it over yourself. Just look at them and say, my season is here. My season is here. My season. What season? The seat of exaltation. What do you mean exaltation? The seat uh, the season when the heavens are open and the blessings of God flow. The season when God will not, will not withhold anything from me. The season where God will bless me even in the midst of a pandemic. Even in the midst of chaos. Even in the midst of darkness. My light will shine brighter. I will be stronger. My children will be more blessed. Even when the world is falling apart around me. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Why? Because he he is an intentional God. Uh, the mask of superiority. Have you ever put on the mask of superiority? I'll confess to you I have. 
Oh, I have. I have caught myself in the past, not since the Lord humbled me. But as a young, and Brother Sean will remember me when I was young. Of course, my mama will remember me when I was young. And I'm talking about when I was in my 20s, young. Sought out there by the church of God more so than any evangelist. I was the golden boy of the church of God as a preacher, a young preacher, preaching in camp meeting when I had only been preaching 10 months, Brother Sean. You were too young to remember that. Brother Sean was only 11 at that time. Preaching 10 months and I'm preaching one of the biggest camp meetings in the church of God. And I had a preacher walk up to me and say, I don't understand this. I've been preaching 34 years and never been invited to preach a camp meeting. And this was where Ron Barnes was at that time. I looked at him with very, I, now I look back on it, it was arrogance. I thought it was confidence. And I said, I don't know about you, but I've been called. It's funny to say it now, but it was an arrogant thing for me to say then. You see, I had put on a mask of superiority. I preached every time. I was preaching almost every night. I went one stint. I've told you this. I preached seven months straight every night for seven months except three nights. I was preaching all the time. I was preaching everywhere. The income was mind-blowing that I had, but I put on a mask of superiority, and I used to think, oh, those poor preachers. They've struggled so long. When will they ever learn? I'm talking about the mask of superiority. Have you ever put on one? No, I don't need you to answer because I know you have. I know you've put on good clothing. I know you've, you've walked out of your house. You've got in your new cars. You've done things. And you looked on people that are in the position where you once were. And you looked on them and said, oh, those poor, pitiful people. See, you've got on a mask of superiority. The Lord says, take it off because I can't do anything with you as long as you maintain that attitude. I make six figures. I make seven figures. I'm better than the one that, that is drawing a welfare check. No, you're not in the sight of God. I must be superior. I live in the best part of the, of the county. And those people in Turner Station, those people at the Meadows who live on checks and get food stamps, surely God has blessed me more than he's blessed them. God may have something for them that will far surpass anything. Thank you for joining us for Hope Alive, an outreach of Greater Hope International Church, Lumberton, North Carolina. You're invited to worship with us each Sunday at 10.30 a.m. and each Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. To learn more, donate, or simply stay in touch with our ministry, download our mobile app, or join us online at www.greaterhopeic.com. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Hope Alive.